David, for that good introduction. And greetings to all you good people out there. And welcome to all you invisible people right out here in front of me. So, I want to extend my honors to some veterans. There are probably some veterans in this group. And I extend my honors to you. We need to pay a special tribute for the thousands who did not return from that awful war, or those wars, I should say. But uh, also, one of the more important things, I want to thank God for bringing me back home from Okinawa, and uh, for, for many other things, for giving me a few years of help, and help and well-being, and a little bit of success. Okay. But uh, most of all, I want to thank Jesus Christ, the author of my salvation. I've been in the school business for in various capacities for many years. For the last five years, I've been working as a substitute teacher in the schools of Fort Worth, public schools there. I found it very interesting. Every time I get a chance to talk to those students about my stories, they, they love to hear it. And I kind of got the reputation as a storyteller. When, the, when I'd enter a school, here would come some students saying, are you, who are you subbing for today? They want to know if I was in their class. I believe those students enjoyed my stories, not just out of respect or to get out of classes, but I think they really enjoyed learning about World War II, and I think it was important they done that. So, so I spent my, not all my time, but I try, only when I could do that. Sometimes I did not have that opportunity. We are now approaching the 75th anniversary of the United States entering that war. And I'm here today to share some of my stories and my thoughts in my life about, about some of that. The, I have written a couple of books that will tell that a little bit better. He mentioned them earlier. The Odyssey of a Purple Heart Vet. And Another one, The Footsteps of a Life Journey. That journey began, began 92 years ago on a small farm in southern Indiana. We didn't have much. Uh, and the, the Great Depression came along during my early, my growing years. And I can remember times we didn't have electricity, we didn't have a car, and I can remember times we didn't have any money. Well, we had food. I claim that that good team of horses we had, coupled with the hardworking members of the family, pulled us through that Great Depression. So it was that it, it's still at the end of my high school year, there's still no money for college. So, but I wanted to go. I worked and earned every penny of my expenses to go to Purdue University. Those were difficult times, but I made it. I got there. Uh, but then one of my part-time jobs at Purdue was to work for an apartment manager for my rent. And one day he asked me to keep his office while he had to be gone. When he returned, the first thing he said, Jim, have you heard the news? No, I had not heard any news. He said, this morning, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. That announcement was a shock to the whole United States, something that was not expected. The, the next day, as you probably know, Roosevelt declared war. He asked the Congress to get war on, the Uni on Japan. Shortly thereafter, Germany declared war on the United States. So we were now 
in that great big World War II, the war of all wars, that the Japanese had brought six big aircraft carriers to within 125 miles north, of maybe 150 maybe, north of Hawaiian. And they sent 180 planes down to attack the, the U.S. airfield and the ships in the harbor at, at Hawaii. When they returned, they dispatched 179 more planes to finish the job. Over 2,500 people died that day. There was a Admiral Yamamoto from Japan. He was supposed to be a very bright, one of the brightest admirals of the Navy that he was the architect of that, of, of that attack. He had given, he had given the leaders of Japan a warning ahead of time. He had told them to declare war on the United States will definitely lead in catastrophic defeat of Japan. They didn't believe him. They didn't think Japan could be defeated. But he was almost a traitor to say such a thing. They sent him to sea as commander of a fleet to avoid his assassination. This same Yamamoto was in charge also of the Midway attack. He didn't know that the code breakers had already informed the Americans of the Japanese plans. So as a result, the Japanese suffered heavy losses at Midway. The Japanese leaders, they lost faith in Yamamoto. Back home, soon after the war, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States began drafting young guys 18 and over. I was deferred a while because I was only 17. Slip this on me. Will that be better? Are they not hearing me too good? No, they are, but that way if you have to sit down, you can. Okay. But soon I would be drafted. On September 14th, 1944, I was inducted into the U.S. Army and was sent directly to Camp Blanding, Florida for training. I had a little edge on the other rookies there. My ROTC training at Purdue and living in a camp uh, at uh, Montana saved me. Now, I, I, I had spent some time in Montana during my deferment because uh, the School of Forestry, they were sending guys to Montana. They gave me a job and sent me to Montana to uh, learn to fight forest fires. There were 100 of us in the camp. And during that summer, we were sent on three major forest fires to help control them. There was a comforting experience I had while I was in Montana. When I had spare time, I liked to take my testament and steal away from the rowdiness of the barracks and go out among those trees where I could worship the Lord alone. But then I was drafted after that and entered uh, with the to Florida to basic training. There was one maneuver I did not like in the basic training. We were told to fix bayonets on the end of our rifle and practice stabbing the bayonets in the dummies hanging from the ceiling. I prayed to God that I would never have to meet up with an enemy and use a bayonet on him. At the end of our 15 weeks, evidently the officers thought we were ready for combat. I never thought I would ever be ready for combat, but I had no choice. We were all given travel vouchers by train to Seattle, no, to um, Fort Ord, California. That meant we'd be going to the war someplace in the Pacific. At Fort Ord, we were put on troop trains to go to Seattle. At Seattle, 
Well, there must have been a thousand people, a thousand men, put on a large transport ship. They were giving us a free sightseeing tour cruise across that big Pacific Ocean. Well, the sight was water for five days. And we, when we reached Hawaii, we could see some of the wreckage of the battle, of the bombing earlier. We had some jungle type training on Hawaii before we moved on. Then soon we were mar loaded on another big transport ship. On that voyage, I met a guy from Waco, Texas named Herb Weathorn, who was also a Christian. We became very good friends. And we made a vow between us that when and if we returned from this awful war, that we would contact our families. Well, fortunately, we both returned. But we went ahead to an island called Saipan. Now, the United States for, had already taken that island a few, years, a few weeks before we got there, maybe a few years, I don't know, at a loss of a few thousand soldiers again. There was a troubling, a troubling sight on Saipan that we saw. The Japanese had built pillboxes on that island. And just outside the opening of that pillbox, at every pillbox there was a pile of snail shells two to three foot high. We understood what they were for, what caused them to be there. It was evidence that the Japanese had not had furnished very little food for their soldiers, and that was evident in many other places too. And then definitely not for the civilians. After about three weeks on Saipan, we were called night one night to pack up. We're shipping out again. We were carried down to the dock and loaded on another big transport. Next morning, I could see there were six ships out there and supposedly all loaded with a thousand men. At breakfast time, Herb and I found we were on the same boat again. We were, we were happy about that. Those, all those six ships sat there in the harbor for three days. Knowing where we were headed, we didn't care if they ever moved, but we'd been hearing the news that there was severe fighting going on in a place called Okinawa. We reached Okinawa one evening, it's still daylight that we could see out across the water. And there we could see hundreds, maybe a thousand, ships all out in that water. I didn't know the Navy had so many ships. One of those ships was a great big battleship. And frequently, it was firing those big 16-inch shells. We could see that projectile and hear it fire into the air then we would hear three large explosions out there inland somewhere. It was our first sight and sound of war and quite discouraging, discouraging to us. Now, Okinawa had already been invaded several weeks before we got there. The story goes, and I suppose the record's pretty clear, that thousands came ashore unopposed marched inland across the island and took the two airfields of the Japanese. There was a O'Hara, Colonel O'Hara wrote in his book after the army and he went to back to Japan that he and two of his generals were standing atop of Shuri Castle, the highest place on that island. They could scan their binoculars and see thousands of ships out on that sea. My, they thought they'd never seen such a thing, I guess. And also, they watched these swarms of soldiers come ashore unopposed with their trucks and their tanks and all their equipment and march across the island unopposed. They had their older men fortified in caves all over that island. Now soon after the invasion, 
a Japanese document was captured and taken to the uh, headquarters for translation. This translation, this document, had been prepared by O'Hara himself, O'Yahara, and it had, it was for one of his generals. It had, it, it, they had predicted the exact place and date. How they knew to do predict that, I don't know. They had predicted the exact place that the Americans would land on Okinawa and also the routes of travel and that they would take the two airfields. It also gave the Japanese positions and their tactics and their plan of action. Well, this really gave an edge and a plan effort, uh, help to the American people to know what to expect. And then they learned from that the Japanese were hiding in these caves all over the island. Caves some big enough to drive their heavy equipment in there, their trucks and their artillery. Well, soon, soon after that, Okinawa became the bloodiest and fiercest battle of the Pacific. They were losing hundreds and thousands of men. But the time we got there, oh, when we heard that, we were there to join that carnage. And we'd been hearing some news on the ship even. So, but, but the time we got there, they had lost several thousand soldiers killed and wounded. We were there to bring these replacements. These 6,000 men on these boats would surely be much needed replacements. And I was one of them. I wasn't happy about that, but I was in one, had to be. We disembarked over that boat, over the side of the boat, in the dark of night, over rope ladders down into landing boats, which took us ashore. And we marched inland, something like two or three hours, I don't know, but we finally were asked to pitch our pup tents. In the morning we woke up and we saw that this was kind of a staging area in preparation to go join the combat. After two or three days of orientation, instruction, and exchanging our M1 rifle for the M1, which was disconcerting, we had never been taught to use the carbine, but again we had no choice. And then, before we left to join the combat troops, a chaplain spoke to us. And of all the things he said, the thing I remember most, he said, gentlemen, I want to I warn you ahead of time. I don't want to be honest with you. Some of you will not come back. Then he said, I admonish you to pray when you're up there in the foxhole. Pray to God. He's your Savior. He didn't have to tell me. I'd already been praying. So we began our march. It seemed like a long way, a long march through mud, shoot up deep most of the way. We came to the foot of a hill and the officers began to send us to various divisions and I would join the 77th Infantry Division. Here come another group of guys. To my surprise, there was Herb Weathorn, my friend. He was joining the same company with me. So we even slept in the same foxholes. That's wonderful. The sergeant had some few words for us and some instruction. He said, once you climb the top of this hill and dig your foxholes in teams of three, I want a third of you awake all night. You take your turns, two hours each. You wake up your buddy and he takes two hours. Be on the alert all night and sleep with your rifles. Be ready for action if need be. So we did, and I have you know, I never slept a wink that first night in a foxhole. There were flares overhead all night lighting up the place. There was artillery shooting overhead and we could hear that loud boom in the land and when the, the volley landed in the, I did not sleep that night. But after that, I could lay down in that hard ground in the foxhole and sleep like a log. Had no trouble after that which we did several nights. 
We were on that mountain a couple of days on guard, and then we began our maneuvers to here and there and hill after hill on that Okinawa with little resistance. Eventually, we came to a plateau of area, something like this, and approaching to Chocolate Drop Hill. We assumed Chocolate Drop Hill would be in our next offensive. We weren't happy about that, but anyhow, the captain told us to dig in tonight, dig in and stay put till we get further orders to move out. That afternoon, he sent six of us on a scouting trip. We didn't get too far till our leader got shot right through the belly. He was laying there moaning on the ground. We felt so sorry for him. They brought up a stretcher and carried him back. I, I doubt that he lived to tell his story. Now, the tank wanted to know where to go, where we go now. We were all rookies, no one knew. I told the tank, tank driver, I said, we need to go back, no one knows what to do. So he put it in reverse and drove back to the company. So we slept in our foxhole that night, pretty uneasy, anticipating what's going to happen the next day, what's going to be happen on Chocolate Drop Hill. But we, we didn't sleep well that night. Next morning, to our surprise, Company B pulled through our lines. They were making the attack on Chocolate Drop Hill. We would be in reserve. Well, that morning, the captain gave me the radio receiver. He said, now you take this and you listen what's going on up there and keep me informed. I need to know what, how they're getting along. I didn't hear much that morning, but soon after noon, I was hearing some yelling, giving an orders, gunfire, and then eventually some screaming for help. I handed that receiver to the captain. I said, you need to hear what's going on up there. He immediately brought up a tank, asked for volunteers to go, go help up there. I knew it would be a dangerous place, but I thought if I could go and be of some help, I will. So I had volunteered and two or three others. We were standing there by the tank, ready to go but something slammed into my left shoulder and knocked me to the ground. I realized I had been hit. I made it over to the medic. He relieved my fatigue jacket and he, we noticed that there was blood oozing out of the place. A little too fast. I didn't like to see that. I didn't want to lose so much blood. I don't know if the bullet from down in my back somewhere went close to a juggler vein or what, but, but it was coming out of there faster than I wanted. I told the medic, I'm going to hold this hole while you patch up the back. So he stopped the bleeding back there and then he patched this one up. He put my arm in the feed jacket of the sling because it was a fracture. He said, take that trail and keep going, you'll find an aid station. I found the aid station and was sent ahead to the field hospital. Where I was treated, put my arm in a cast for the bone to heal, and sent ahead to Hawaiian Islands. At Hawaii, one morning, an officer came to my bed and warned me the purple, purple Heart. I didn't know that, but he said, this is what you get for being wounded. From there, eventually, Hundreds of us were sent to Nashville, Tennessee here, just outside of Nashville, a big recuperating hospital. I might be pointing the wrong direction, I don't know. But anyway, we were there, ready to go back for the invasion of Japan. No, we were not ready. They were ready to send us. But one morning we woke up with headline news. Atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima killing 50,000 people. Oh, we thought surely Japan will surrender. No, they were ready to fight on. They did not surrender. Three days later, as you know, another bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, killing another 45,000 people. The leaders still wanted to fight on. They wanted to defend their country. For the first time in history, 
the Emperor of Japan, Hirohito, met with the war leaders. He told him, we, gentlemen, we must, uh, we must surrender to save our country. He also went that day to the microphone and spoke to the people of the land. He had never done that. He was, a, he was their god, and he was aloof. He never spoke to the people, never talked to them, never, never showed his face. He got on the radio and spoke to his people, said, we are surrendering to the enemy to save our country. So it was, Japan did surrender then, and we didn't have to go back to Japan. Though I was sent to North Carolina, there it was to ten complete my tour of duty. I was, they did, were discharging the fellows as much as possible. Mine would come later, so I was there at Fort Bragg. I disliked Fort Bragg a little bit when I first got there. I could see nothing but white sand and scrubby oaks and big old barracks. I thought, this is not a bad place. This is, this is a terrible place but for me to have to come to finish. But I was there anyhow to finish. But you know, you have heard that sometimes a dark cloud has a silver lining. I started going to town. I wanted to spend time, and I didn't like Fort Bragg, so I'd spend as much time as possible in that city of Fayetteville away from the camp. In the USO, I was shopping around. Rosie. One of the things I found was a church I liked to go to. It really enjoyed that church service. It was so much like I'd been accustomed to back home. But there's something else I noticed in that church. There's a beautiful lady, very attractive. And she seemed like a very nice girl. I'd like to get acquainted with her, but I don't know how. She comes with her mother every day. I don't know how in the world I'm going to get acquainted with her. I was a little backward to meet girls anyway. But eventually we did. We got together, and she became Mrs. Willis 70 years ago. And her name is, was Berlin Barefoot. I liked that name the first time I heard it. Different. I never heard that name. She is right back there in the audience. Now, would you stand up, Berlene, so they can see you? I have you know that she still is the joy of my life. And we enjoy many things together. Let me conclude my story with this. The United States has never gone or fought a war to be a conqueror. It's always been to defend freedom or to protect uh, the, the people of other lands that do not have freedom. Our forefathers wrote a document, a very important document, guaranteeing the freedom and integrity of people forever, for all time. Let me give you the second paragraph of the second the paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, with life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. You understand, these were great men, these were devout men. They believed in God. They believed that we were created by God to be free. And let me conclude with this final thought. Let us pray that we will always be able to say, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Excellent job, excellent job.